No nation has been able to eliminate poverty, not just reduce it, eliminate poverty without significant, rapid economic growth for 20 to 30 years. And I'll give you some examples. Look at the world champion for this, China. Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping, considered the architect of China's growth, set a target in 1980 to take China's GDP, the size of China's economy, to four times its level in 1990, take China's GDP of 1990 to four times that level by the year 2000. Malaysia, 1991. Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad, in his Vision 2020, set a target of taking Malaysia's 1990 GDP to eight times its level by the year 2020. Notice how countries do this. Doubling GDP every decade. And that's why in my book, Do Pakistan, Har Pakistani Gharane Tak Pushali, Two Pakistans, Prosperity to Every Pakistani Household, I propose that we target eight times Pakistan's 2017 GDP by the year 2047. But it's not enough just to set targets for economic growth. We also have to set targets for poverty elimination. And this has been an aspiration in medieval times as well. Look at this Mughal miniature from the time of Emperor Jahangir in the 1620s. He's eliminating poverty. Although he looks like he's eliminating the poor, he's eliminating poverty, although he looks like he's eliminating the poor. My proposal is for Pakistan to make sure that by the year 2047, all Pakistani households are living on more than $2 per capita expenditure. And just to put that in perspective, in 2019, 80% of Pakistani households were below this level, which translates to 45,000 rupees expenditure per month for a family. Think about 45,000 per month for a family. How much food, how much education, how much health, how much clothes can you buy for 45,000 rupees a month for an entire family? 80% of Pakistanis were living on less than that. Thundering along, I'm going to give you the example. It's difficult to imagine increasing the size of an economy eight times. I'm going to give you an example. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm going to give you the example of one company that we know well, Samsung. To imagine how increase in GDP, increase in um, sophistication, economic sophistication, can help reduce poverty. 1938, believe it or not, Samsung started as a noodle business. Noodle business basically means flour mill. In simple Urdu, atta mill. That's where Samsung started, 1938. By the 1960s, let's try to fix this up. You get the picture. By the 1960s, Samsung was one of the frontline businesses of South Korea, doing textiles, doing sugar, Rice, sound familiar? These were the frontline industries of South Korea in the 60s. That tells you where Pakistan stands, but 60 years behind some of the world leaders. Next, 69, black and white televisions were added to the, to the assembly lines of Samsung, going up the ladder of sophist economic sophistication. By the 1970s, with, a, with help, plenty of help from the government of South Korea, Samsung was, create, was developing petrochemical plants and selling petrochemical products. And in 1974, the most bold visionary decision made by my Samsung at that time was to make a 50% equity investment in Korea Semiconductor. They had the vision to see that computers were the future. And semiconductors are going to be central to the development of the computing age. And they've never looked back since. Now think about where Pakistan stands today. The industries you hear about every day, sugar, flour, cotton, textiles, they happen to be towards the bottom of this ladder which Korea was already crossing in 1974. We have to go up this ladder and beyond, beyond the corner that you see up there. 
And let me, let me also make a proposal for what we can start doing today. This kind of economic growth, it requires that we eliminate, dismantle our economy of stagnation. And you hear the word mafia in our political lexicon, and it's true. For sector after sector after sector, you will see just a handful of businesses get, taking great benefit, more benefit than others, out of the, the economic activity in that sector. And this is not just because they're bad people. They may be bad people. It's because the laws and regulations underlying those sectors allow this kind of economic stagnation and mafia behavior. So please keep in mind that rhetoric does not change. Rhetoric does not kill economic mafias. Criminal investigations do not kill economic mafias. Competition kills economic mafias. And this is what you have to look for when you're hearing slogans about how the economy is changing, the economy is on the path to, to greater prosperity. Always ask, are our companies being able to compete with each other, to get better, compete with the world? Just like the Pakistan Super League brings in international cricketers, which improves the game of our cricketers, just like we compete in the World Cup. That's exactly how companies improve their game and gain more value, create more economic value. Just remember, competition kills economic mafias. There's one more thing that I wanted to, wanted to make sure you are aware of. As you try to increase GDP, eight times the GDP, well, who's going to buy all this stuff? What is GDP? Just the value of all the goods and services we produce. Who's going to buy all this extra stuff? Well, it could be consumers, which is the majority today. But our consumers are, as I told you, they have very little purchasing power today. So that's not going to make it. Is it, is it possible that governments can do that? Possible, but the government has very scarce resources. Won't be able to buy eight times the size of the current economy. They barely buy 10, 15% of it today. Can investors do it when uh, businesses invest, when they build factories, uh, they buy stuff to build, say, petrochemical plants? Well, a lot of the things they buy, we don't produce them. So that's not going to make it. Well, the obvious answer, the world economy can buy the extra stuff we produce. And this is what, over the last 50 years, every country which has been able to grow for 30 years at more than 7% GDP growth real, in real terms, they have done it pretty much through export-led growth. So look for export-led growth, look for increase in exports. The day that our exports are able to go beyond our imports, that's the day you can be, you can be content that we are on the path. Now let me connect all this talk about the economy with the reduction and elimination of poverty. We're in the 21st century, it's the age of knowledge, and the countries that are ahead are the ones that create new knowledge to create new wealth. And that's why knowledge and education become central to getting ahead in the 21st century. And so looking up, looking, looking at this ladder, you see more economic sophistication, more knowledge, more research, and that requires more education. And link it to individuals and their ability to increase their earnings. The global experience is that the more educated you are, the more you are able to gain from growth, the better jobs you are, you are able to get those better jobs. And so this is the link between economic growth and poverty reduction. But the, proviso, the, the requirement is that you have education for all your people. So let's look at that. The truth is eliminating poverty is not going to happen by growth alone. The reason is there are two Pakistans, two Pakistan. Hai. It's, it's the truth. And let me define this. It's not rich Pakistani, poor Pakistani. It's not English medium, Urdu medium, Pakistan. I've got, I'd like to, you to think about a very specific definition of do Pakistan, which is ask yourself, for how many Pakistani households can we confidently say that their next generation is going to do better than this generation? And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is only 15 to 20%. These Pakistanis, I say, live inside the castle of prosperity. And the rest are locked outside the castle of prosperity. Look at education, look at ability to afford health, look at jobs. You're going to find castle wall after castle wall. 39% um, of our 
labor force is illiterate. And if somebody is illiterate in 21st century, it's very unlikely for them to be able to improve the lot of their children. Looking at the coming few years, 46% of Pakistani kids of school age are not in school. So that's another castle wall right there for you. Looking at health, basic health units take care of family medical issues like maternal health or infant health, child health. And the number of basic health units in Pakistan are only sufficient to cover half our population. Another castle wall. That's why I, I hope you begin to see why there are so many Mughal miniatures in, in this presentation and in my book. So let me highlight one more specific statistic related to a topic that we should be talking about a lot more, which is, power, which is population. And there is an impression that among educated Pakistanis that the reduction of poverty requires reducing the population growth rate. The opposite is true. Population growth rate falls as poverty falls. And let me just illustrate this by looking at showing you data from Pakistan itself. The parameter to look at often is not population growth, but fertility. Among the top 20% of Pakistani households by expenditure, this, these are the folks inside Pakistan's castle of prosperity, every 100 women have 270 children in their lifetimes. And this is similar to East Asian countries, which are more advanced than us. But among the bottom 80% of Pakistani households outside the castle, every 100 women have 420 children in their lifetimes which is more like sub-Saharan Africa. Think about how much of a burden for mothers, how much of a burden for families to educate their children, etc. Right there, you have two Pakistans. And the population growth rate can be reduced by eliminating poverty. And that's the thing you have to remember. Now, one more factor to keep in mind is that with automation, the time to reduce our kind of poverty with this much illiteracy and this many Pakistanis with no skills or low skills, the time to eliminate this poverty is going away. And let me illustrate by showing, pointing out another miniature from Emperor Akbar's time. This is 1571, the construction of his favorite capital, Fatehpur Sikri. And the eyes, usually you focus on him at the top with his construction package. But look at the bottom. If you focus it on what those laborers are doing, what technology they're using, you begin to get reminded of construction sites in Pakistan today. 1571 in 2021, there are some similarities you see in construction work going on. Those folks cannot eliminate their poverty in a generation. So it's true when, when you hear that construction gives employment to the poor, it's true. But it, that's pretty much all it does. We need to eliminate the poverty, not just give a little bit of employment to the poor. So answer is industrialize. Yes, we must industrialize. And you hear this, and there's beginning to be great consensus on this. But always keep an eye out on what sectors we are going to industrialize into. For sure, we need the high tech that I talked about earlier. But we are going to have a huge tens of millions of Pakistanis who don't have education, who don't have the skills. And we're going to have to pick sectors that also employ those. And this is what many countries that have made it, including China did. So pick sectors that create low skill jobs as well while protecting the environment. Keep an eye out for that. Finally, let me talk about Pakistan's welfare state. Half of, half of the basic health units have not been built yet that we need. Pakistan today needs a million pr more primary school teachers. We have to train them. Pakistan needs tens of thousands of more schools. We have to build them. For that, we need we train doctors, nurses. For that, we need to make sure that we have a stronger financial footing for our welfare state. We can't just focus on government allocations for these, these, uh, these sectors like education, health, vocational training, job training, etc. We need to find other ways to finance them, otherwise we're not going to make it in time. We need bank loans for college, uh, college education. So people can take loans and return them when they, when they start earning. Um, we need a real universal healthcare scheme in, to which every Pakistani household pays to the level that they can, just like they've done in Turkey in recent years. And this part we have to do by 2030. 
if we don't get every Pakistani child in school by 2030, we're going to have, there's a chance we're going to have illiterate Pakistanis in 2047. And that, ladies and gentlemen, it will be a crime on all of us. So all of these things are a handful. And it's going to take a national determination to achieve them. So my proposal is that we must adopt a Pakistan resolution of the 21st century to, de to deliver prosperity to every Pakistani household by the year 2047. My question to you is, what are you willing to pledge to make good on this challenge of delivering prosperity to every Pakistani household? Thank you very much.